you. Good. Well, last week we started, um, and we're going to end today with God versus money. My favorite topic. I'm being sarcastic. Um, so, God versus money. And uh, we know that money makes the world go round. We know that we can't live without money. And the question that I asked last week, um, and only one person or one, um, the cutest little one, is she here this morning? Nevea? Where, where's Nevea? Nevea, what makes people happy? Hey? Nevea screamed out last week, and she was the only person, honest person in this place to say money. Thanks, Nevea. But Matthew chapter 6, the question is, what do we need to be happy? And yes, most people would say that I'm not quite sure, but what I know is it's always a little bit more. It's always a little bit more. What makes us happy? We looked at Matthew chapter 6 last week and we saw that even as we look at money, Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and He says, you can't serve two masters. You either hate the one or you love the other. And then He goes on and He says that you can't serve God and money. Last week I highlighted that when it comes to money, money must not be our master. We shouldn't be slaving over money. money we shouldn't be a slave to money but we're supposed to be a good steward of money. We need to manage money well. Now, Jesus does speak a lot about money in the New, New Testament. We see that this is spoken about in the Old Testament as well. But the one thing that we can identify is that we need to be a good steward of money because this is what God has given us and He's blessed us with. Man has put a worth on money and the value on it. It's unbelievable of how people will go crazy over money. Now, let's use a, um, a denomination or let's use a group of people where all of us as, as a South Africans would agree on and we would all say amen and we'll all come together and no matter what the color of our skin is, we will say yes. Now, when we look at the evil of money, corruption in the government and all the South Africans say? Yes. See? Told you. One, one unifying factor, we know that when it comes to the evil of money and the misuse of money, we can agree on it. But the problem is that the love of money is the root to all evil. Money is not. But it's the love of it. And we find that we become slaves to it. So last week I highlighted of what it means to be a good steward of money. There's a few things that I mentioned. Some practical ways to manage your finances. This is biblical principles found in the book of Proverbs and throughout Scripture, biblical ways of how to manage your finances. Not so that we can become prosperous and uh, rich, but so that we can become content. I mentioned last week, for those of you who were taking notes, that contentment is one of the most spiritual disciplines you could have. Because in your life, you will always want a little bit more. So the first thing that I said was, get out of debt. Get out of debt. Use the snowball effect. Start with your small debt first and lead up to the big debt. Get out of debt. The Bible says that we should not borrow money. We shouldn't be lending money. I don't know how many of you guys sleep well at night, but I thank God that I do. Yes, we have a bond and we have a car payment, but we shouldn't be owing people money. Get out of debt and do it aggressively. The one thing I failed to mention last week is that this process is going to be a process. But start doing it. Get out of debt. Number two is act your wage. Act your wage. Meaning, don't spend money on things that you can't afford with, pe with money you don't have to impress people you don't like. Cut up the credit card. When Truett sends you that, and like, oh my word, you get so much credit. Fantastic. They don't tell you about the interest you're going to pay on that. Am I right? Act your wage. 
You don't need that big screen flat TV. <laughs> you don't. You don't need that smartphone that costs 24,000 Rand. Because I promise you, you won't even use half the features on that phone. If you're not satisfied with your Xbox now, you'll never be satisfied. Am I talking to someone? Stop spending money that you don't have to impress people you don't like. Number, number three, get on a budget. God is always about plan. God is about planning. God is not about blind faith. When we talk about take a leap of faith, you know, swipe that credit card because God will provide. No, no, no. Guys, I can do something about ugly. I can't do something about stupid. Get onto a plan. Get onto a budget. Account for every cent that you spend so that you can live a life of to be financially free. You ever heard those words? The bank uses that often. And then they slap onto that, but you can get a loan for 100,000 rand cash to be financially free. Get onto a budget. If you don't know how to do that, please come and speak to us. We will help you. We will help you to manage your finances. And it's going to be aggressive, and you're not going to like it, but it's okay. I'm there to help you for the glory of God. Number four, save and invest. Save and invest. Save your money. Have a savings account. Save and invest. Save for the future. Save for your old age. Save. Okay? I'm coming back to this. You don't need that double cab right now. Because you're only earning 20,000 rand and you want to buy a double cab that costs 500,000 rand. It doesn't make financial sense because a rainy day will come. Am I right? And it just so happens that Satan knows when. Where the stove will break and then the lights go out and then all of a sudden you need to be at hospital and, 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 and. Does it make sense? The last one, and this is where we ended last week, is that when you understand the principles of this to get out of debt, to act your wage, to get onto a budget, to save and invest, this is what happens to your finances. God blesses you in your finances so that you can give. So that you can give. The Bible, in terms of God's character and who He is, we learn from God's Word, is that God is a giving God. He teaches us what it means to be generous with our money. Because I got news for you. That trailer that you're hoping to take with you to the grave is not going to happen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I've done many funerals, but I haven't seen the trailer parked behind the hearse with the house and the car and, you know, the fancy earrings and the diamond ring and all of that that goes with it. I haven't seen that, but God has blessed us and this principle of giving. This is what it means to be a good steward of the money that God has blessed you with. Again, I'm going to end this point on this year of being a good steward of money, is that what you have does not belong to you, because we all agreed last week that everything that you have belongs to, everything that you have belongs to God. All you're doing is being a good steward of it. Number two, let's move on. Number two is that, yes, number one, we need to be a good steward of money. We are not slaves. Money should not be our master. We should not be operating as the world operates. And number two, in, we, in order to be generous and in order to steward our money well, is that we need to trust the master. We need to trust the master, the one who is our master. Because the scripture says that in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And he goes, you cannot serve God and money. 
You cannot serve God in money. But we know as believers that Christ is the one that is our master. If everything belongs to Him, everything should be devoted to Him. We should be seeking Him and asking Him as the master, as we come before Him as the slave, to say, Lord, what do you want? How should we be managing our money well? We should be coming to Him first. But because of our own selfish desires and because of our own needs and our our own wants and a lack of contentment, we don't seek God's help first, but we will seek the bank first. We will seek a new interest rate first. You see, to Jesus, money is almost, it almost operates as a rival to Him. So when you actually analyze your heart, you see, the truth is that God, the God money, invites us to worship what we really worship. Think about the things that you really worship. Think about the material things that you have. Now, I'm not saying you, you, you shouldn't be taking care of it. You need to be good stewards of it so that it can glorify God. But what I'm saying is that is it taking the place of God in your heart and in your life? So, in trusting the master, if you're taking down notes, in order to trust the master with our finances and everything that we have, it starts with salvation. It starts with salvation. This is our testimony as believers. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And all God's people should say, Amen. right, we have been saved and raised up with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, you should hi highlight this and underline it. This is your testimony. For by grace you have been saved through... We say that again. By grace you have been saved through... Through faith. And this is not by our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of the works, so that no one may boast. It's not about the size of your bank account. It's not about how much you feed the poor. It's not about how much you serve. You're not getting brownie points for that. You are saved by grace. We did not deserve it. While we were yet still sinners, as Paul says, we were saved. We were saved by grace. Through faith. So this is it. it. Through salvation, it builds up our faith in our character that knowing that God's got this. With our finances, as we honor God, it speaks about our faith. Do we trust God enough that God can be in charge of our finances? Guys, it's all well and good to quote the Scriptures. But here's the issue, is our lack of faith. And you know what the Scriptures are that we commonly use? Our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Have you ever heard that? And God will provide. Do you believe that? Monday's coming. I've said this before. Today we can use the Sunday school answers, but Monday's coming. Will we trust God enough that He will provide? Then we learn in the Old Testament of a name that was given to God because He was Jehovah, our provider. When we pray and we're sincere with the Lord, we say, yes, Lord, you will provide. But when Monday comes, who is our faith in? You see, because that's when the evil of our heart and the to, coupled together with the enemy teaches us that, you know what, it's okay to wheel and deal, to steal and to scratch my back so I can scratch yours so that I can get a quick buck. Am I speaking to someone? This is it. It starts with salvation. 
It is by faith that we believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed us. It is by faith that we believe that we were once sinners, deserving the wrath of God. It is by faith that we have received Christ's forgiveness. It is by faith that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. It is by faith that we believe that on the third day He rose again. It is by faith that we trust in Him with our whole being because everything belongs to the Father. So when we commit our finances to Him, especially in our giving, it is faith and trust in Him, not in people. Just recently we had a situation, and in fact, it's the common thing for for me to deal with as a pastor of the church, is that people give stuff to the church. And they give it wholeheartedly, use it as you feel it needs to be used. And then when they see that it's not being used, they leave the church. If you didn't know it, it happens. And the more I say, well, but you gave it to the church. Like the church can do with, if we don't need it, you know, we can bless somebody with it or we can do something with it. But people get upset because of material things. The point that I'm trying to make is that when we have faith in Jesus Christ and we give stuff over to Him, we have faith that He's going to manage it well. But it starts with salvation. Let me share a story with you. This one time, Jesus was walking to Jericho. And while he was passing, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 2, he says, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Ever heard that story? There was a man by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. Now, we learned from previous sermons, especially um, having a meal with Jesus, is that tax collectors, because they were Jewish people, uh, the Jewish people felt that tax collectors betrayed them because they were working for the Romans. And Zacchaeus was the worst of them all because he was a chief tax collector. And as a tax collector, what he used to do is that he used to collect the taxes that the Romans needed to take a portion, but he would overcharge the Jewish people so that he could have a portion for himself the chief tax collector. The story goes on and he says in verse 3, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up onto a sycamore tree to see him, and for um, he was about to pass that way. Verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. So basically the people that were following Jesus, I'm I'm assuming the Pharisees were there, and there were other Jewish people, they all grumbled. He has gone to the guest of a man who is a sinner, verse 8, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house, since he, has, he, since he also is the son of Abraham. Verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The moral of the story is that when salvation comes to your heart, it softens your heart to be a generous person. Salvation came to the house of Zacchaeus, and he was convicted in his heart that he robbed people financially. So the Bible tells that he gives to the poor, and then those that he robbed, he gave back fourfold. When it comes to our heart and money, is that when we understand the power of the gospel, it is the power of the gospel that changes our heart. You might get annoyed with me. You might get irritated with the fact that every single Sunday you hear the gospel over and over again. But I want to ask you one question. Do you understand the depth of the gospel? The depth of the gospel needs to penetrate our heart that changes us to become generous people, specifically with money. It is the depth of the gospel. It is the fact that Christ paid it all for each and every one of us. And the product of salvation, the product of the conviction of our heart is that we serve 
and we give. That's the fruit of it. The softening of our heart, that everything we have belongs to God. But you see, we can also fall into this category. This one time Jesus was walking and there was a young man that had a lot of money in the book of Matthew chapter 19. And the, this young man approaches Jesus and says, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones should I keep? He says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for ye had great possessions. When the gospel impacts your heart and there is genuine salvation, your faith relies in God and all your possessions belong to Him. All your money belongs to Him. So when He says, take up your cross and follow Him, yes, Lord, I will, because my hope and my trust is in You. But you see, church, just like this young man, is that sometimes we can be very religious. I've kept all the commandments. I've kept all the commandments. I go to church every single Sunday. I ticked the box. I read my Bible. I prayed. I served. Religious people. Religious people don't focus on what the gospel has done in terms of the transforming work in our heart and the work of the Holy Spirit. No, the tr religious people look at the practical elements of what's happening in the life of the church. This is when it comes to the church's finances. For some of you, you would see in the bulletin, yes, there is some difference in terms of finances, but my faith is in Jesus. Yes, we can look at the numbers and the sense, I, and, and I get it. But if God is promised, if God is promised that He will take care of His church, I believe that. All we need to do is be faithful and generous with what we do. Does it make sense? Trusting the Master is that we need to have kingdom thinking. It starts with salvation, but we need to have kingdom thinking. When we understand and have a deep understanding of the gospel, we get to trust God more for our daily bread. But you see, for some of us, church, is that our daily bread makes us anxious. The daily bread makes us anxious. How are we going to feed today? What are we going to do today? Where's the clothes? Where's the money? Where is this going to come from? But we are so quick to acknowledge the Lord's prayer when it says, give us today our our daily bread? Where does our faith lie? In what we can do or what God can do? Yes, we go to work 40 hours a week for some of us even more. And we get anxious at the end of the day because SARS takes half of our money and then we need to pay school fees and we need to pay this and we need to pay that and we don't see our money. But church, I want to say to you this morning is that when you are faithful to God and have kingdom thinking, and I'm going to get to this. When you understand kingdom thinking, you will see that there won't be a lack, but there'll be contentment. Jesus, again, on the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses this issue. He says in Matthew chapter 6, and please turn with me there, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. He deals with this issue of worry. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They, they neither sow nor they gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Verse 27 and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan or his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. 
how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And there it is, O oh, you of little faith. Verse 31, therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need what? Your heavenly Father knows. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He says, but this is it. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. You know what he's speaking about kingdom thinking? He's speaking about your heart of generosity. The currency on hev- in earth is money. The currency in heaven is relationship. Love God and love your neighbor. Kingdom thinking. And then we move on into kingdom giving. Now this is a tough one for me, but when we realize the gospel, the byproduct of that and the fruit of that is to honor God in terms of what we give Him. My first year of full-time ministry as a youth pastor um, I remember the day that we attended a, um, I think it was a school fete or market at my baby sister Cheslin in Hudson Park Primary School. And, um, and myself and my wife, we were there, and I ran into one of my friend's dads. Grew up in front of him, um, had lots of parties at his house and, and that type of thing. So he asked me, so what are you doing now? So I said, no, well, God, God's called me into full-time ministry. And a statement that was what said to me, which has never left me, And it makes me think often in terms of um, people that are unchurched, people that are, that just don't know who Christ is, of the way that they think about money and it comes to church. And he said to me, oh, so you're going to be one of those pastors that takes 10% from his people. I didn't know what to say to that because I was pretty young, but it affected me of the mindset of 10% to the pastor. But when we learn from God's word of what that means, we see that a tithe or 10%, that's what tithe means. It means 10%. It means giving a tenth, okay? We find in the book of Leviticus, this was an order given by God. In fact, it was a tax that needed to be given to the high priest or given to the Levites because they didn't own any property. And we see that this was given for the benefit of running the temple of running the religious duties of the day to make sure things are happening. And we see that this principle of the tithe came into play throughout the Old Testament. And when we come to the book of Malachi where God addresses this, and this is a text that we've been discipled in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 to 12, if your Bibles are still open, when he speaks about the tithe, he says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from the statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. This is Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 6. And then he goes on and says, but you say, how shall we return? Verse 8, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have I robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me the whole nation of you, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear says the Lord of hosts, then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a, for you will be a land of delight, says, says the Lord of hosts. Now, 
For some scholars, they say, well, you know what? That was for the Old Testament, and the tithe stops there. And God was upset because the people owed the 10th percent because they were not doing that. They were disobeying God. In fact, even some of the priests were robbing the people of that, and it was not honoring God in that way. But we see that it was a principle not because God needs our money. I hope you know that. Eh? God doesn't need our money. I'm just trying to put that out there. God doesn't need your money. Neither do I. Ooh. God doesn't need your money. Neither does the church. Let me tell you what. Now this is getting deep. It's about how much faith do you have in God? That's what it's about. Now, we might say in the New Testament that we shouldn't be paying the tithe. Jesus doesn't, uh, doesn't come against it. Because even as he addresses the Pharisees in the book of Luke, this is what he says. In Luke chapter 11, verse 42 to 44, he says, What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect more important things. So the tithe is not given away, but it's a guideline. It's a guideline of how much, 10% to give. Should you give out of your gross or should you give out of your net? It doesn't matter because he goes on further in the book of Second Corinthians, as Paul says, is that God delights in a cheerful giver. It is not my job to compel you to give. It is not my job, like the prosperity gospel preachers, to stir up your heart and to tell you to give so that you can get. No, no, no. The scripture tells you is that you need to be a generous giver. In the Old Testament, it was a guideline for 10%. And after what Christ has done for us is that we should be giving over and more because of what Christ has done for us. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, verse 6 to 15 tells us. Let me read it for you. It says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart of how much you must give. Church, my job is not to stand up here at the pulpit and to tell you how much to give. It is what you decide in your heart by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's a heart thing. It's a faith thing in what God can do for you. I'm going to close with this this morning, even as we get prepared for communion and the worship team makes, it, uh, makes their way up. One of our members um, sh shared with me of their dad. As they were growing up, life was really tough. And as the dad started to study of what it means to give God a tenth, he found out that as he started to pay his 10%, there was a breakthrough in his finances. That where he is now, with these boys that have grown up and have left the house, where he is now, that God has blessed him with so much that he gives more than 10%. Not because somebody's guilted him, him into it, it's because of what he's decided in his heart. Now guys, this is not a message to say, give so that you can receive. I'm saying, be generous to God, honor God in terms of your 10% and your tithe to the storehouse so that it can be managed well for the glory of God. Honor God, have faith in God, put your money in His hands. That's what the tithe means. That's what offering means, is that Lord, I trust you enough. I believe in you enough. I am generous enough, Lord, to you so that you will take care of me. Church, it's not a, a quick get-rich scheme. I don't believe in those. I believe in hard work. I believe to work and to earn money by the sweat of your brow. I believe in work. But in terms of contentment, that's only found in Jesus Christ. So when you understand that, when people look at you in terms of your generosity, when people look at your contentment in the way that you live and you do life, when people look at the way that it's not about the big, the better, and the faster, when you are content with your life, people are going to start asking you questions. And here's the question that they're going to ask you. In 1 Peter, it says this, do you have a reason for your hope? What is the reason for your hope? What is the reason for your hope? 
is Jesus Christ. The reason for your hope is that the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This morning as we come around the Lord's table, that's what we're going to acknowledge. The reason for your hope, the defense for your hope is that Christ died for me. And that's all I need to know. In terms of contentment, I need Him. I need Him. Let's all stand together. Even as we sing the song, and even as, Andre, if you guys can start handing out as we sing the song, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thanks, Inga.